So, I am going to start with a different problem than Dr. Plank or the book started with because I think it's helpful to see something where you definitely might want to use recursion and it's natural. So, Fibonacci numbers. Some of you have seen them, some of you haven't. But a Fibonacci number is one where the Fibon nth Fibonacci number is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Okay? And furthermore, f of 0 equals 1 and f of 1 equals 1. And I know there's some that define f of 1 is 1 and f of 2 is 1. I don't care. That's how we're going to define it. Okay, so f of 2 is equal to what? Actually, tell you what. I'm going to make you figure out what the first five Fibonacci numbers are. So figure out what f of 5 is. Just take a couple minutes and figure out what f of 5 is equal to. It would make sense. I've never heard the word Fibonacci it like spiral, but it's the same. Okay. Okay. Okay, what is f of 5? 8. Very good. Now, there's two ways you could get to 8. Okay, one is you could start building up the Fibonacci numbers from the bottom. Okay, so we know that f of 2 is f of 0 plus f of 1, which is 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2, f of 3 is equal to f of 1 plus f of 2, which is equal to 1 plus 2 equals 3, f of 4 equals f of 2 plus f of 3 equals 2 plus 3 equals 5, and f of 5 is f of 3 plus f of 4 which is equal to 3 plus 5 or 8. That is what we call a bottom-up approach. Okay, we started at the bottom and went up to 5. So that's a bottom-up approach. How many of you used this approach to solving it? Okay. The second approach is we could have started with f of 5. We could have done the top-down approach, which is we know that f of 5 is equal to f of 4 plus f of 3 which then we know that f of 4 is equal to f of 3 plus f of 2. And we know that f3 is equal to f of 2 plus f of 1. Okay, and then we could further break it down. f of 3 is f of 2 plus f of 1. So we just did this one right here. Then the next one is f of 2. That's f of 1 plus f of 0. Then f of 2, again, is f of 1 
plus f of 0. And we know what f of 1 is. It is 1. Okay, and you could keep breaking it down like that. And you can see that this f of 2 is going to get broken down to f of 1 plus f of 0. And if I've done it right, I now have eight terms. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all of which are 1, and I get 8. That's the top-down approach. Okay? So I can go either top-down or bottom-up with it. The bottom-up approach would use a loop. You'd basically say for i equals 1 to 5 or for i equals 2 to 5, and you would build it up like that. The second approach, that, so that's bottom-up. The second approach is top-down, and it uses what we call recursion. Okay? So what recursion does is it breaks a task into one or more smaller subtasks. And the subtasks are identical in the way that you solve them. Okay? And eventually, you may get to a subtask that is small enough that you can solve it without further subdivision. In this case, if you got to F0 or F1, you could solve it without further subdivision. And then you combine the results. Okay, so recursion essentially has three steps. Okay, it has what we call the recursive case where you break a problem into one or more smaller, the key word here is smaller, but otherwise identical tasks. So the only difference is the input to each subtask is different. Then you have the base case, what we call the base case, where eventually the subtask is small enough is small enough that you can solve it. without further subdivision. And step three is you recombine or you combine the results of the subtasks to get the result. Okay, and recursion is all around us. You just don't normally think about it. But when we count votes on election night, that's essentially a recursive algorithm. Okay, you don't have a single person counting all the votes at election headquarters. Instead, it's farmed out to precincts, and each precinct counts its votes. And then the precincts forward the results to central headquarters where they're added together. But precincts, well, I may be getting this somewhat wrong, maybe it's districts, and then, but let's just pretend precincts might have multiple voting locations, like multiple schools or rec centers, so they might further delegate the task of vote counting to the individual voting centers, okay? And the individual voting centers would tally the votes, and they would forward that to the precinct and then the precinct up to the election headquarters. But it's subdivided even further. What do you think is the so-called base case at the um, voting location, like at the school? 
There's one other thing. What do you vote on? The voting machine. The voting machine is like the base case. The voting machine keeps track of the votes for that voting machine. That's the base case. Then they, at the school or the rec center or whatever, they aggregate the results from each of the voting machines. And then they forward it to maybe the precinct level where, again, they aggregate all the votes from the different um, voting centers. So that's kind of recursion. It's a top-down process. So recursion is definitely a top-down approach. And hopefully you wrote down what I just wrote down because unfortunately neither the book nor Dr. Plank's notes put it this clearly as to what are the three components of recursion. But these are the three basic components of recursion that you need to be comfortable with. Okay? So in the book they used the example of mowing a lawn, which I don't think was a particularly good example, but kind of let's say that it's a big lawn and you have a lawn service. Okay? So one person doesn't necessarily do the entire lawn. Maybe the lawn service has 10 employees and they can distribute them between gardening and the lawn. So the big boss comes out, looks at the lawn and says, oh, it's too big, I'm going to divide it in half and I'm going to give, say, five of my folks to each part, to each half of the lawn. And then they may look at it and say, it's still too big. On the left lawn, maybe it's still too big, so they divide it again in half. And now maybe they decide when they divide it in half that the two halves are small enough that one person can handle mowing each half. That's the base case. When you get the lawn small enough, the area of the lawn small enough that you can have one person mow it rather than having to further divide it and assign it to two or more people. So that again is an example of recursion. Okay? You've done that naturally anytime you had a lawn that was too big to cut and you subdivided it and maybe spread it out among several people. That was recursion in a sense. Okay? My last example. Okay? Let's say I gave you 2,000 cards with names on them. This is a problem. My dad was a textbook author and he used to keep all of his citations on 3x5 index cards. This is the 1980s and we don't have computers yet. So he keeps each citation on a 3x5 index card. And at the end he has about 2,000 of these cards and he used to give them to me and he'd pay me to sort them into alphabetical order for his textbook publisher because he literally sent all these cards to his textbook publisher in sorted order and the textbook publisher came up with the bibliography. Well, pretend you're in my shoes for a moment, okay? You have 2,000 cards with net last names on them. They have other information, but 2,000 cards and you need to get them in sorted order, okay? Think about what approach you might use to sorting these cards. And now I'm going to pick on someone. Zeki, I'm going to pick, well, first, uh, what would you do? As you look through them, I would like to set up like 26 piles. 26 piles and put them A, B, C. That's what I did. I chose, I made 26 piles, the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, the E's. Okay? It turns out there's a few last names that are more common than others. Okay? So the X's aren't very common. It turned out that even with 2,000 cards, there were only a few X's, and when I was done sorting the 2,000 cards into the 26 piles, I could pretty much quickly just put the X's together by using what we call insertion sort. I would look at the first card, then the second card, and put them in sorted order. I can tell you that M's and S's are probably the two 
largest numbers of last names in the um, English language, okay, based on my experience. When I was done sorting cards into the M&S piles, there were still too many cards to sort easily. There might be, say, 80 cards in the S pile and 50 in the M pile. So what do you think I did at that point? Same thing. It was more piles. Okay? After an M, how many piles do you think I probably had? Now well, you didn't have 26. Come on. Think about the English language. The vowels. Usually you ended up with five piles. Okay? There's a couple of strange names that maybe have M and like mnemonic, but for the most part, you end up with five piles at that point. That's not true for the S's. For the S's, you end up with a few more. There's ST, there's SH, um, there's SM, but you still, the point is, I was doing it recursively. Okay? I subdivided it into 26 smaller but identical subtasks. When I was done distributing them to the 26 piles, I had the similar subtask of having to sort each of those piles into alphabetical order. Okay, in some of the cases, like the S's and the M's, I had to further subdivide the task. And again, I created more piles. But eventually I got down to the base case. The base case was where there were so few cards in a pile that I judged it feasible to just sort them by putting them into sorted order, basically inserting them into the right order. Okay, and how do you think I eventually combined the results of the subtask to get the final result? When I had each pile sorted. Yep, I just basically I plunked the plunked the piles on top of each other. The A's got plunked on top of the B's and the B's plunked on top of the C's and the C's. Okay, that was sorted at that point. So the recombining was pretty easy. It was just plunking or I could have started and I could have gone the opposite. I could have plunked the Y's on top of the Z's and the W's on top of the... But you get the point. It's pretty easy to do the recombination. Okay? So that's recursion. Okay? You break a task into smaller but otherwise identical subtasks. At some point you get to the base case where the subtask is small enough that you can solve it without further division and then you combine the results. Back here, what was the recursive case? If I, so if I specifically show you these three statements, which is the recursive case? the top one. So that's the recursive case. What was the base case or cases? These were the base cases. And what was step three? Pardon? Combining them how? How did I combine them in this case? I added them. This was step three. Just a simple addition. Okay? So that was the base case. Now, I want you to write your first recursive program. If you have a piece of paper, do it on a piece of paper. If you have a computer, you can do it on a computer. But what I want you to do is try to write fib int n. So you get int n and you need to return the Fibonacci number associated with n. So I'm going to go down to my office, get my power cord, which I don't have, come back up and you have some time to write it down.
Okay, so let's see how we write it. I'm first of all going to write it in a slightly wrong form. Well, you'll see why. So if first you'd normally write in a recursive procedure, you normally first write the base case. So if n is equal to 0 or n is equal to 1, I will return 1. Else, I will return the recursive case, which is fib n minus 1 plus fib n minus 2. And that is the entire recursive function. Very elegant. Okay? Easier to write than the loop version although you could write it with a loop, and more in keeping with the definition of what a Fibonacci number is. So you typically write the, so it starts out with a test for the base case. So the first thing in recursion is check, the ba check if it's the base case. Because if it's the base case, there's no further recursion required. And then here's the recursion. These are called recursive calls because we're calling the same function just with different arguments. And the important thing is it be in some sense smaller so that we make progress toward the base case. We keep um, subdividing the problem. Now, there's a slight problem with my definition here, which is something you have to be very careful about with recursion. Can anyone spot a potential problem with my um, function? Pretend you're a black hat hacker. Very good. Passing it a negative number. What happens if I pass it a negative number? It just keeps going. It's called infinite recursion. It's like an infinite loop. So just like you have to be careful not to have your loops go infinitely, you need to make sure that you cover all your bases with recursion so that you don't enter an infinite recursion. Okay, And eventually your program would seg fault because it would get something called stack overflow, which we'll consider in a moment. Okay, So I'd have to add another check. Now I saw one of you wrote, if n is less than or equal to 1, return 1. That's fine if you decide to, you might decide to define a negative Fibonacci number as 1. So if you define a negative Fibonacci number as 1, it's fine to write if Then it's fine to write if n is less than or equal to 1, return 1. That's safe. That will always exit at least. Or if you decide that a negative number is an error, then you might say if n is less than 0, return say minus 1 to indicate an error condition, else if n is equal to 0 or n equals 1. The point is you just need to be careful and handle that negative case so you don't get into an infinite recursion. Now, it does turn out, I will tell you a word of warning. Did you notice when I did the top-down approach how quickly the terms proliferated down here with the top-down approach? Okay, because it got to 8 terms just for f of 5. For f of 6, it would be 13 terms, which is 8 plus 5. For those of you who don't know it, the Fibonacci numbers 
fib of n is, I believe, roughly equal to n to the 1.6 pow. Uh, yes, no. 1.6 to the n power, which is exponential. <laughs> so if you're not careful, you'll end up with an exponential number of calls here for your recursive case. So it turns out in this particular case, using the loop and the bottom-up approach is a lot more efficient than doing the recursive approach top-down. That, or you can do what's called caching. Okay, because once you know the result to f of 3, then f of 4 is f of 3 plus f of 2. So if I know the results of f of 3 and f of 2, I could quickly calculate the result um, for f of 4 and so on. But again, that's beyond the scope of this class. My point is if you're not careful, recursion can very quickly come up with an exponential number of calls in some cases. This is one of them. Okay. Now, you, in this case, we split the task kind of into two. And there's two normal cases in recursion. We split the um, problem into two, or sometimes we just split it into one. So another common thing you see is factorial n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial, 0 factorial equals 1 is the base case. So that's a case of recursion where there's only one smaller task. Okay, there's not two, there's just one. In the case of my sorting with 2,000 cards, there were 26 subtasks that you recombine. Okay, so all I'm trying to point out is recursion can have one or more identical subtasks. The point, the second thing is the subtasks are smaller. Third point is eventually the task becomes small enough you can solve it. We call that small enough a base case. And four, you recombine the results. Okay, and we're going to be using recursion. One place it's used frequently is with games. So when computers play games with you, the so-called artificial intelligence is usually using recursion. And on Tuesday, we're going to show you all day, we're going to spend the entire lecture going through how to solve Sudoku, a Sudoku puzzle using recursion. Okay? But the general approach for many games, let's say it's chess, okay, in chess, white gets the first move. And white has a whole bunch of moves that white can try. Okay, after white has moved, the board position is changed. And black has a move. And black gets any, can make any, out of each of these positions, there are any number of legal moves for black. Okay, so recursion is a very natural way for chess playing programs to figure out what their next move is going to be. What they do is they start from the current board position and they, it's their turn, they make some number of moves, potential moves. They examine some number of potential moves. Each of those is a recursive call where they're eff effectively passing in to the game solving function the new position. And then the game solving function switches roles. It becomes black and considers what are black's counter moves. Okay? And it can only go so far in this tree because it has to respond within a certain amount of time. You set the limit for how long the computer can search. So the more time you give it, the deeper the computer can get in this so-called tree, and the better its move is likely to be. Okay? So it tends to limit the amount of search time in each of these subtrees because it needs to consider multiple different moves. But it's using recursion to do that. Okay? And it's using something called backtracking, 
because at some point when it gets to a certain point, it says, okay, it's time to return to go from this point back to the parent and continue down some other route. At some point you have to stop the search, go back up to the parent and continue down another line. So that's called backtracking. You do that a lot too. If you're searching a maze and you get to a dead end, you retrace your steps. That's backtracking. So recursion was originally developed in, well not originally developed, it was developed a long time ago, but one of its first uses in computers was with games. For, and it was back in the 50s for doing backtracking. And in general, recursion is used a lot in artificial intelligence, where you have to explore multiple avenues or multiple potential solutions and then backtrack because some of the solutions are really bad. Okay, it's like reaching a dead end. Okay, so that's the idea of recursion. The second thing is how is recursion implemented in the computer? And for that we can go and look at Dr. Plank's notes. The answer is it's very easy using stack frames. Okay, so let's look at an example program. Here's his recursive function A. What it's doing is if A is, if I is greater than zero, then he is calling A on I minus one and he is multiplying J by I. Not a very interesting program. There's no recombination going on here. But he's just wanting to show you how recursion is implemented. This is a fairly nonsensical example because it doesn't really accomplish anything other than counting down from n down to 1 and printing out some stuff. So he starts out and one thing to notice is there's a lot of i's. Here's an i, here's an i. So in 102, how these i's were managed gave many of you problems, but in 130, you went over stack frames. So there's a stack frame for main that keeps track of the local variables for main. And when main calls a sub 3 right here at line 16, then the stack frame remembers that it's at line 16 and that the current value of i in main is 16 and it pushes onto the stack a new stack frame for A. A has its own version of I. For this version of A, it was called with three. So I is equal to three. And it has a local variable J. J is set to I times five, so J gets set to 15. At line 7, we check to see if i is greater than 0, and it is, because 3 right here is greater than 0, so we call a sub 2. So we remember that the call was made from line 7, and we push a new stack frame on for the call to a sub 2, and now i is equal to 2, and j, its version of j is set to 10. Notice that doesn't modify the j for the version of a that was called with i equals 3. It has its own version of j. Okay, so then again, a sub 2 calls a sub 1, and i is equal to 1, j is equal to 5, and again, it calls a sub 0, which Dr. Plank doesn't show, but he does call a sub that, and i is equal to 0. j, actually, that's not true. I take it back. 
it does not call a sub zero because when, no, it does. One is greater than zero, so it does call a sub zero. So a sub zero gets called, i is zero, j is what? Zero. And it does some printing, but at this point we've reached the base case because i is zero, zero is not greater than zero, so we're going to end up returning from the function, which means that this stack frame gets popped. Okay? And then as we continue, more and more stack frames get popped. Now, with recursion and with programs in general, it can be a little hard to see what's going on. That's why we came up, or we encourage you to often use GDB. So I'm going to show you the same program using GDB. Okay. So first of all, some of you are asking, why don't I, why doesn't GDB give me certain debug information? You have to compile both your .cpp and your .o using the .g flag. If you don't, the C++ compiler will not insert debug information. So the .g flag is necessary to tell the compiler to insert debugging information. Then I can compile it, again using the G flag. Okay, so Dr. Plank's make files don't typically have the dash G flag in them. So if you're using his make files, they're not going to be GDB ready. If you want to use GDB, you'll have to either modify his make file or you'll have to hand compile so that you use the dash G flag. Now we boot it up using GDB. I can list the program with L. It lists the first, wherever we are, it lists 10 lines. And I am going to break at line 11. So B stands for break. And I'm going to break at line 20. Now I will say run, and we start the program, and we break at line 20, where i is set equal to 16. Okay, if I say n for next, it executes 20. If I print out i, it's 16. Now, if I do n, it will um, execute the next statement, but if it's a function call, it steps over it. However, because there's a break statement in there, we step into it and we stop at statement 11. Now, BT stands for backtrace, and it shows you the two stack frames. So A with I equals 3 is currently at line 11, and we are currently sitting at line 21 in main. And I can use the info command to look at my locals. So info shows that j is equal to 15. Okay, now I can do n for next, and it printed out line 11 was a print statement. Okay, here is line 11. So it printed in procedure a, and it printed i and j. There's the print. Now it asks if i is greater than 0, and you can see it is, so we ended up in A with I equal 2. And if we look at the stack, you can see there's another stack frame. And the one with A sub 3 is resting at line 12. The one with I of 2 is currently at line 11. If we do info locals, we see J is equal to 10. Continuing... Now the backtrace shows us with A at 1, and we'll continue again, 
and we have A at zero. Okay, if we now step, I is not going to be greater than zero, so watch what happens. We step to line 13. We step past the if, we're later in procedure A, and we print again I equals zero, J equals zero. Now we're at the end of the function. We're at line 14. Okay? Right now, if I do backtrace, we still have a sub i equals zero. I hit next, and now we have returned to the previous one, a of one, and it picked up execution. It had remembered that it was at line 12, and it picks up at execution line 13 right here and if we do a backtrace you can see that it has popped off this stack frame and a sub 1 is back on top. So now line 13 is a print so when we do next it prints out the values for i and j and again we're now at the end of the procedure when we say next we're now back into a sub 2. If we do a back trace, you can see that a sub 2 is on top. Okay, continuing, we're now back to a sub 3, and we print its values and exit, and now we're back to main. And when we print its i, if we look at the locals for main, its i is 16, so its i hasn't been tampered with, so when we print its i, it prints out i equals 16. And the next now means we are done. So GDB can be very helpful if you're having trouble visualizing recursion. But the idea that I want you to get from all of this is that the way recursion is being implemented in the computer is with stack frames. So each time, this it doesn't actually, every time a function is called, whether it's recursive or not, a stack frame for that function is allocated and is pushed onto the stack. And there is memory for its um, arguments and for its local variables. And we call this memory stack allocated memory. Remember, I keep emphasizing the difference between stack allocated memory and heap allocated memory. So the memory for locals and for arguments is stack allocated memory. It's automatically reclaimed for you when the function exits because the stack frame containing that memory is popped off of the stack. Okay, when the function, if the function is called a second time, the variables start from scratch. They don't retain their old values because they were lost. They were thrown out in the trash, so to speak. Okay, so this is how recursion is implemented. Next time, we are going to go over a full-blown example of how recursion is um, used to solve the game of Sudoku. It is also, the technique we use on Tuesday will be used in Lab 9. So if you skip Tuesday, you'll have no idea how to do Lab 9. As for Lab 8, you'll notice I gave you two hours to do the exam yesterday. The reason is Lab 8 is just a repetition of stuff you've already covered in the course with hash tables. And we went over the algorithms for D-list in class. So I didn't think you needed to have a presentation for Lab 8. I think you can do it on your own. So if you have questions, so feel free to post them to Biaza.